Today we're going to explore why most evangelical blogs seem to be left-leaning these days, what are the sociological causes of that, what are the market causes of that, and how they can regain a lost reader base that they never really had. When I wrote for Desiring God and the Gospel Coalition right more regularly a long time ago, long time ago, two, three, four years ago, I wrote primarily about emotions. And compared with those authors who wrote about church doctrine and theology, my articles did exceptionally well in terms of readership. And while I was actively writing for these publications, my readership was extremely high compared with other authors who were writing for these same publications. And simultaneously, I gained an enormous uh, audience of readers who just followed me through email and social media and things like that. And through interacting with, these, with this audience, I discovered that about 80% of them were female. And some of these platforms sort of corroborated that kind of data, uh, corroborated, corroborated that data for me, okay? And I was single at the time, so I think the fact that many of these readers saw me as a possible romantic interest also played a part, right? But being an emotionally intuitive and smart, sort of alpha male-oriented guy gave me a unique platform in a niche among women. And the reason that I did so well writing for these platforms is precisely because my content played so well to a female authorship. So I, I've worked in Christian publishing for several years, and at, well, I, one of my roles was as an acquisitions editor. And there is one piece of folk wisdom among Christian publishing that guides a lot of book acquisition and marketing. And that piece of folk wisdom is this. Men don't buy books. Women buy books. Okay? That governs most publishing acquisitions and market, marketing strategy, okay? So even books that we acquired for men were actually marketed to sell to women mainly to buy for their husbands and their sons, et cetera, right? So this production mindset creates an internal cyclone of brand refinement, right? To, to which future publishing decisions are directed by the typical female reader rather than by an attempt to reach the male reader. It's, it's sort of considered a lost cause in many publishing circles. And so in theory, especially in Christian publishing circles. So in theory, and this has certainly played itself out in the marketplace, intellectual books were for men. That was sort of the only angle or the only note that Christian publishing could play for men. And emotional books were for women. And even books that felt like they were for men really felt like they were for women. Or books that were written for men really felt like they were more effeminately marketed. So at the same time that Christian publishing started trending female in terms of its vision, in terms of its eye, in terms of its market, then at the same time here in 2016, 2017, the content industry was disrupted by leaders broadly affiliated with what has been come to be known through the New York Times as the intellectual dark web. And the audiences of the, in, of the intellectual dark web were heavily masculine. So the, 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 uh, the authorities were people like Joe Rogan and Jordan Peterson and Ben Shapiro, Sam Harris, Jocko Willink, right? Fighters, Navy SEALs, brash intellectuals. And these thought leaders and these intellectuals were characterized by four practices which attracted men specifically. Number one, they were they they appraised the physical or they were physical okay so the positive valuation of physical aggression through brazilian jiu-jitsu and exercise and combat and diet right that that was a value especially an aggressive oriented physicality which christian blogs very much lack very much lack it is very much a beta male uh climate in christian editorial work okay uh, so so it lacks the physical and that's what the intellectual dark web authors and speakers have really been to recapture for men is a validation of a physical rather than the restriction and almost the degradation of the almost a hatred for the physical among evangelical typical evangel evangelical bigger blogs right uh, and so there, there is there's a value of the physical that attracts men. They're also patriotic. So an explicit reverence for American values and identity. And in Christian circles, certain platforms express patriotism, I guess. You've got these blogs like Pulpit and Pen or whatever, but they, but they really lack the intellectual excellence that warrants their be taken seriously by male readers because most ma male readers are very smart. And so so male readers are, are for the most part, they, they are dissatisfied with most of these female-oriented literature, which place the lowest common denominator and are likewise kind of, uh, you know, underserved by Christian academic literature, which dim diminishes the value of bodily care and training. And most, you know, Christian blogs right now are kind of anti-patriotism, 
they're kind of anti uh they're saying well yeah you can be a patriot but don't let it inform your faith in any way and sort of there's sort of this antipathy toward the love of country especially among evangelical blogs right well don't let it become an idol don't worship the country that kind of thing and these guys like jocko and joe they and ben and shapiro they double down on american values they love america and they're unapologetic about it and that attracts men. So they're physical, they're patriotic. Third is that, that they're pedagogical. Okay, a lot of these Christian blogs, are so, they, they don't actually teach you anything, anything at all. They're just saying the same thing over and over and over again. They're just looking for more ways to invent ways for you to feel guilty for why you're not being spiritual enough. That's all it is. That's all it is. Okay, and, 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 and in among um, podcasts like Jocko Willink, who literally does book reviews of hi of historical memoirs of soldiers. Joe Rogan, who has all, all these scientists over from all these different places to discuss science and philosophy and, and, and diet and exercise. Jordan Peterson, right, who is a, a psychology professor at University of Toronto, used to teach at Harvard. Ben Shapiro, law degree from Harvard. Sam Harris is a neuroscientist and a jujitsu. All these guys do fighting. All these guys uh, are physically oriented. Maybe Ben Shapiro a little bit less, right? But he's still extremely intelligent and they're able to put all these things together that's one place that ben does excel at though is the pedagogy and so you they're physical they're patriotic they're pedagogical none of which are characterized in in excellence or manifested in excellence on, on in this sort of christian blogosphere and the fourth and i think this really ties it all together is that each of these intellectuals and each of these figures in the intellectual dark web typically they what they do is they engage in taboo that, that that's the fourth aspect is taboo and and each of these intellectuals and leaders typically they swear on occasion and they engage in so-called locker room talk you know that would never be found in the pages of publishing generally and certainly never in the pages or or on the blogs of higher christian literature and among christian content creators only the progressives who are sort of sort of so laughably anti-intellectual and, and and effeminate and unmasculine you know they might use curse words but but you never have in the intellectual blogging space any kind of crossing of a cultural taboo drawing outside the lines of christian culture because as soon as you do you are sort of exiled from the community you're not taken seriously anymore you're looked at as kind of that guy who uses you know crude talk and there's no space within evangelicalism for men to violate the cultural taboo i'm not saying the glorifying sin but kind of you know, drawing outside, I mean, there's a little bit of room for this, but really drawing outside the cultural lines. Maybe they swear, maybe they drink, maybe they smoke cigars. That's, again, that's becoming more mainline, but it's still not very accepted, right? It's still seen as kind of a fringe thing. And, but among men, these are, these are primary cultural ways of signifying your masculinity. Yet among Christianity, we, can, we don't really like it. We don't want to enjoy ourselves too much. We don't want to be too physical. We don't want to do any of the things that really signify masculinity and manhood. And so in that sense, uh, all of, but those are the very things, this physicality, uh, patriotism, uh, their pedagogical and crossing the taboo. These four elements, I think, drew the, uh, uh, the male audience and the male readership out of nothing. And now Jocko, Jocko is becoming New York, New York Times bestseller. Ben and Sam are New York Times bestsellers. Jordan Peterson is a New York Times bestseller. And the people who are buying all these books, these are all men. And the Christian publishing industry has no idea how to reach men. And the Christian publishing industry, most of all, has no idea how to reach men. Then, under Obama-era leftism, Christian antipathy toward typical formulations of politics and gender grew as the nation itself grew in polarization. And many publications, many Christian publications had to choose. Do we try to do go a middle road here? Do we go conservative or do we go to, do we start leaning to the left? Where do we go in order to keep our readers? And many publications went the way of the reader, which is they're 80% female. And in a boycott culture, it was very easy to alienate readers by posting one wrong, one wrong article. And in this way, we see among many larger evangelical platforms a race to, accom uh, to accommodate the Democratic Party ideals without compromising their Christian values because there was a heavy gender divide in this last election. And so, since their reader base is 80% women, they were actually having to accommodate a majority left-leaning readership audience. Okay, and 
which attract which then once you start accommodating that left leaning audience, you're going to attract more left leaning audience and lose more of your conservative audience, right? And the easiest way to do this was through an emphasis on social justice and a moral critique critique of Donald Trump and affirmation of interse intersectionality culture, which you see all the time on Christianity Today and other platforms. I maybe shouldn't mention, but maybe in the future I will. All right, but in temperament and in content, the the major Christian publication platforms and publishing houses they forgot how to speak to real men they only know how to speak to women they only know how to speak to women and the and 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 the publishing cultures have accommodated and attracted this sort of energy and consequently new editorial staff hires for these institutions were offered to effeminate men who sent I'm, I'm, I'm killing any shot i have at any future partnerships right but 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 these these staff hires for these institutions where they were given to effeminate men mainly whose whose sensitivities were not really aligned with the typical joe rogan listener or jocko willink reader or jordan peterson zealot right and in its adoption of left-leaning scripts about race and justice and their need for men to simply listen and shut up and all that kind of stuff, right, rather than to speak, then the silently neglected male populace within, evangelical, you know, within evangelicalism, they simply re replaced many typically Christian content sources with secular sources. So even in so doing, many male Christians felt guilty and uneasy for sourcing from non-Christians all this common sense, male-oriented, scientifically oriented, anecdotal, uh, anecdotally informed, right? All this advice about politics and self-discipline and combat training and weightlifting and professional development and weight loss. And it's like, yeah, you're not getting any of that from Christian sources. You're not getting any of that from these Christian sources. None of it, because they don't care. Because they don't care about men. They don't care about reaching men. They care about reaching the book buyers in men's lives who are women. They don't care about understanding men. And nevertheless, the most well-endowed evangelical institutions are expressively neutered in comparison to common cultural expression of masculinity. Right? Aggression is basically demonized as a vice of wrath within evangelicalism. Right? Body lifting and power lifting are demonized as vanity and self idolatry. I remember seeing, a, a, some, it was, I think it was a blog on Desiring God once, where it, it was t Piper talking about exercise. And he says, Well, of course we don't exercise to look good. Why not? <laughs> Why not? Because according to that view, it's vanity, right? And sexual attraction toward women is rebuked and vilified and it's rape culture and you're a dirty man for wanting to be with a woman, right? There's almost no space to even say, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm totally attracted to beautiful women. Ugh, you dirty, rapey man. You know, that's sort of the perspective, even within these mainstream blog cultures. And I, wa I know a lot of these editors and that is the feeling that's it's very left leaning. Right. And even though. The most, I mean, and, and this doesn't even take into account, it shows how little le that leftists understand male psyche, right? Because what next to like, obviously compulsive sexual fantasies, what is the most common male fantasy? Is it to, is it to rape and pillage? No, it, the mo most common male fantasy, and I think most guys would attest to this, most common male fantasy, again, outside of sexual fantasy, is to save women, to rescue women, from attackers is to protect the innocent is to be a hero that's why superhero movies do so well if you hadn't put that together right because men men by nature the majority of men by nature especially western men aren't rapey men they're not male gazing but they're not not whatever this leftist control of the white male who's just like this beast is that's not who a male is and that's that's who they think that they're rejecting as a reader is this bestial creature but it's not because men want to protect. They want to do good. They want to build society. Of course, there are chaotic men who's, 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 who have evil natures, but that's not the majority of men. And those men, the good men, the majority of American men are being called up and conscripted up by these figures like Joe Rogan and Ben Shapiro and Jocko Willink because they're embodying and they're dignifying and they're acknowledging their better nature. They're acknowledging men can be good and men are good and they know categorically how to inform that and how to inform that through physicality and patriotism and intellectual excellence and taboo cultural taboo which men need in, in order to grow men need cultural taboo in order to grow and all, uh, evangelical uh, platforms issue all of these things for the most part in short evangelical publishing platforms have neutered their own content in an attempt to
to keep their 80% female base. And you see this just as much at Christianity Today as you do at the New York Times or the Washington Post or the New Yorker. And in this way, the evangelical male reader that these evangelical institutions never really had started showing up in record numbers for men who were willing to champion their ideas, which so excellently expressed the male version of prosperous humanity. And this includes mockery of so-called male feminists, right? And this includes the ability to identify a beta male and to believe that there is something uh, unfitting and unbecoming of such men. This includes the praiseworthiness of physical effort and the male body. This includes the celebration and incorporation of male aggression into a fabric of spiritual practice. You couldn't even conceive of that, could you? This includes a version of masculinity that doesn't require a man to neuter himself culturally and psychologically in order to culturally survive among those with whom he shares a common Christian faith. Evangelical institutions have lost all of those values, even if they affirm it in principle. This whole complementarian biblical manhood thing, honestly, I don't find any of those guys credible. I don't find a single one of those guys credible. Not one. Evangelical institutions have lost or are currently losing all of these men. And evangelical culture has, in large part, become a culture tailor-made for beta males. And I don't say that as a way to posture to anyone, oh, I'm an alpha male. That's not what I'm saying. In fact, I think that most Christian men within the evangelical institutions, I'm not saying they're all beta men. What I'm saying is I think most of the men who are within evangelical institutions, they want something more because they sense that they really don't fit there because they have a sense of aggression and unction, right? That, that, is, that is distinctively male, that they want to manifest through creation. But, even, but evangelicalism's constraints are just too much culturally culturally they're too much what is the solution the solution is for evangelical institutions to learn how to celebrate and cultivate traditional male values in a way that isn't tacky and neutered what does that mean it means that current evangelical guard needs to reshape its vision for the ideal man from a beta male version to a real man okay and 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 eventually it's going to be incorporating those four values which the intellectual dark web has so well manifested, but they do it in this way. Okay, the, the, listen, if you can't admit that there is such a thing as an ideal man, then you're living in a delusion because there is. The ideal man is a hunter. The ideal man is a weightlifter. The ideal man is very intelligent. He is a hard worker. He is studious. The ideal man knows how to tell a good dirty joke in small company. The ideal man knows how to create a community of men who are seeking the same ideals. The ideal man knows how to fight. The ideal man knows how to change a tire. The ideal man knows how to cook a steak. The ideal man knows how to honor his wife. The ideal man knows how to raise his kids. The ideal man knows how to work. The ideal man knows how to delegate. Of course, no one is the ideal man. But the point is that the ideal exists and is worthwhile. And that's what makes platforms like Jocko and Rogan and Brett McKay at The Art of Manliness better sources for Christian men than anything Christian platforms currently have to offer. They are all imperfect men seeking after an ideal. And evangelical culture needs to reacquire a taste for these traditionally masculine ideals so that men can come together around them and pursue them, not merely so that they can come up with a Christian way to be a hunter or a fighter, but so that they, they can become good at being men and consequently good at being Christian men. What is the strategic way that evangelical institutions can reacquire these ideals? Honestly, just the same way that these secular figures have attracted so many men in such a short amount of time. It must become physical and patriotic and pedagogical and taboo. You have to somebody who can speak credibly and authoritatively as a man about these things. You need manly men in authority and in authorial and writing positions and editorial positions at these institutions. This will be extremely difficult for Christian platforms to do. And I don't know if they will do it. I don't even know if they should do it. I'm just saying this is what they have to do if they want to talk to men.
But this will be difficult for Christian platforms to do since doing so will risk their relationship with eight, their 80% female audience, very likely now a 90% female audience. And this could be accomplished one of two ways. First, Christianity Today or a similar sort of evangelical content site could sort of str strategically broaden its, its brand by making key strategic editorial and staff uh, 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 sort of writer hires that reshape the public voice of the of the blog or the brand itself. And there are merits to this move, but it, it genuinely risks the survival of the platform since in the content industry, reader experience is king and an offended reader is a lost reader. So unfortunately for those platforms, I, that's not that th there's no one easier to offend than leftist women. So I wouldn't actually recommend, for example, again, a blog like Christianity Today, try to become a more masculine voice per se, although I think they could use some conservative hires on their editorial staff. This is a second strategy these institutions could utilize to pick up on the giant upsurge of young conservative evangelical male content consumers and book buyers. And it's to do this is that they could start an ancillary website or an ancillary brand similar to what Christianity Today did kind of with their previous site called Hermeneutics, uh, which is now called CT Women, which is a very bad branding move because all the CT brands are all the Christianity Today brands are very weak. Uh, precisely because the, the, their niche grabs attached to a hollow and bland Christianity Today moniker, which used to mean something, but it doesn't anymore. So, so, so instead of starting a, a bland left-leaning podcast for the site about the Bible and social justice, which are pointedly un uninterested or uninteresting for white men, I think, um, except for the male feminists, of course. Uh, 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 instead of starting a bland left-leaning sort of brand they ought to hire the most Joe Rogan-like creative in the public eye who's a Christian, hire him and allow him to build a brand that they own that pursues the excellent cultivation of male competencies from a Christian perspective. I think that's what they ought to do. Start sort of a men's site, kind of an art of manliness. Christianity Today could start something like an art of manliness site that would do well for them. And that they could, it could be a version of TT or a version of the Gospel Coalition or DG that was really male oriented because it partnered with Christian men in positions of authority in 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 these arenas. Christian Christians who are winning CrossFit games, Christians who are you know uh, hunters, Christians who are fighters. This kind of thing, integrating that all into a single platform would attract a lot of men. Um, and if evangelical platforms and publishing houses fail to recognize why they have lost their male readership and why they may never have really had them. And if they remain unwilling to make an offensive, traditional and bold branding integration of male interests into their content strategy, then they will, f they will fall by the wayside as other Christian sources, which actually utilize these values, uh, uh, will do it for them and succeed in these areas for them. I'm, and I'm thinking particularly of, of uh, you know, like doctrine and devotion with these guys, they're very into, very pe pedagogically gifted, patriotic, right? They, they value the physical and they cross the cultural taboo with cigars and whiskey and, and, and tattoos and all that stuff. And I don't think it's just a tacky brand grab. I don't think it's an image thing for them. I think it's genuinely, they're genuine men. And the guys at Doctrine and Devotion, Jimmy and Joe, the reason that they, uh, uh, the reason that their image is what it is, isn't because they're trying to create an image. It's because they're men and they express that masculinity in traditionally masculine ways, in badass ways, right? And that's why most of their, I thought I would guess that most of their listeners are men, particularly because they're willing to do what nobody else in evangelicalism is willing to do because they're so scared of losing their female readers. Evangelical blogs can re, can regain a male readership and they can they can capitalize on this huge upsurge of young male conservative readers. I don't think they will, but if they could, it would be very easy. And that's what I would do is I would start something I would start a unique separate brand that you that they would own that wouldn't be branded by the original brand and it would be essentially a new brand that is male oriented that is that values the physical is patriotic is pedagogical and is allowed to violate cultural taboos without glorifying sin of course. <laughs>